So just because it says single use doesn't actually mean it can only be used for a single use. It just means the manufacturer chose not to do the cleaning validation. And as we talked about before, but this third party or commercial reprocessor has come along and gotten an FDA clearance if required uh, to do just that. Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right. Every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Hank Balch and Justin Poulin. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Dan Vukalich, president at AMDR, the Association of Medical Device Reprocessors, which is a trade association representing the interests of the global commercial medical device reprocessing and remanufacturing industry. His specialties include the industry's legal, legislative, regulatory, and public relations interests. Hank, I think there's a lot of parallels between reusable medical devices and devices that are being reprocessed, but because it doesn't happen right in the department every day, this is a great topic for technicians to sort of understand what's happening behind the scenes with these single-use devices, and really the cost savings opportunity is enormous. That's right, Justin, and to be realistic, there are thousands of um, technicians who work for these reprocessors who are doing very similar things to what a sterile processing technician would be doing uh, in a hospital setting. Uh, I say very similar and not exact, and we can get into some of those specifics with Dan, obviously, but it is a, an industry that we are arm in arm with and, and trying to get the best quality products to our patients at the best price. So I'm excited to talk to Dan about what that looks like from the trade organization side of things as well. Yeah, and his experience uh, in legal matters and legislation, I think, will really give us kind of an inside look on how the industry has evolved over time. Uh, obviously, it was something that was brand new, and it really wasn't that long ago. It's not like reprocessing single-use devices has been around forever. I mean, for somebody who's a young technician, it might be, it might have been around for a good majority of their life. But when you think about how long a surgery has been going on, it's a fairly new concept. But again, as we mentioned, the cost savings is, is enormous. But I'm interested to get a little bit of the history from Dan on how this evolved and what steps did they have to go through to make this a legitimate um, business opportunity for hospitals across the country to take advantage of and and really initiate a competitive marketplace. That's right, and get into some of the specifics as well on how is it possible to reuse and reprocess a, quote, single use device. <laughs> uh, as a starting sterile processing technician, I remember seeing the first one of those and uh, thinking to myself, okay, so this is this is really single use. When they get done in the, in the OR, it's going to go in the trash and we're never going to see it again. And uh, the longer I was in the industry, I remember the first time that I heard, oh, no, those go into a different bin and then they're reprocessed. And it didn't make sense for me for a long time. So uh, hopefully it's an educational opportunity for some of those technicians as well who uh, just aren't familiar with this entire process. All right. Well, you can follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info. The Facebook page, and we are getting a number of new listeners, facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast. LinkedIn is linkedin.com slash company slash beyond clean. And you can send us an email to info at beyond clean dot net. And if you want a list of all of our shows with full descriptions and timestamps for each segment, you can go to beyond clean dot net. We'll be right back with Dan Vukalich, president at AMDR. We are speaking with Dan Vukalich, president 
at the Association of Medical Device Reprocessors. And Dan, just want to thank you for coming on the show. We definitely haven't talked about this topic yet, and I think it's an exciting one and relatively in the scope of things, a, a new discussion for, for some out there. And uh, I, I know this is a great savings opportunity for, for many hospitals that are looking for that, um, looking for those extra savings these days. So I'm glad you came on to to talk to us and, and give us a little bit of more insight into the industry. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and indeed, I think everybody's looking for uh, for solutions. We all have to do more with less than healthcare these days. And so I think if we can uh, introduce the subject of reprocessing to some new people, fantastic, or reintroduce it, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to start maybe just getting a little bit of an introduction to you out to our listeners. Talk a little bit about your your background, maybe you know your biographic uh, experience, and then what interested you in this industry specifically, and how did you find it? Sure, sure. Yeah, how does one come into the trade association world? It's sort of a typical DC question. So AMDR is based in Washington. That's where I'm calling you from, Washington D.C. And, uh, you know, sometimes D.C. gets a bad rap, right, with the lobbyists and the politicians. But uh, I came here in 1996. I was 18 years old. I, I went to school here. And, and like so many who do come to Washington at that age, I was willing to work hard. I was willing to work for cheap because I wanted to make a difference. And so I, I worked through college, frankly, full time. I went back to my home state of Minnesota to work on a Senate campaign but I was itching to get back to Washington. And sure enough, this small trade association that had just formed called ANDR was looking for somebody to sort of run their day-to-day operations. And this new industry was looking for help on everything from public relations to government relations um, to legal issues. And I had an interest in all those things, but the additional interest I had was on environmentalism. And this industry obviously does a lot in reducing medical waste, and so I started. I gave it a whirl, and here I am, 18 years later, still with the Trade Association, now um, having taken over uh, from my predecessor as president. Can you talk to us a little bit then on what uh, these particular trade organization that you represent, AMDR, who are they, how long have they been around, what's their mission? Sure. So AMDR is a 501c6 organization, which means it's categorized as a nonprofit trade group. So in the same way that other trade groups like the American Nursing Association or ISHM are also trade groups where people in that sort of business come together, except I have just five members, but those five companies all in the business of SUD reprocessing do a majority of the commercial single use device reprocessing, both in the United States, but also in Germany. And in fact, my, the member companies serve all of U.S. News and World Report's top hospitals and a majority of U.S. hospitals. So we're really proud of that. Um, but just to give you a little bit of, of, of history, AMDR was formed in 1997. Uh, back then, a small band of about five companies had come together and they had started these new businesses, realizing all the waste in single-use or disposable devices that were simply being thrown away. And so they created a trade group, AMDR, to represent their you know, mutual interests from a legal front and from a regulatory front before Congress, before FDA, but then also to other trade groups like the American Hospital Association, um, and then ultimately groups like Amy and, and the other organizations that we now interact with on a daily basis. Yeah, so talk a little bit about those groups that you collaborate with in the industry. You mentioned Amy. What what does it look like for your organization to work with Amy um, as a trade organization? Yeah, I think Amy is a perfect example of sort of a trade-to-trade organization. You know, I think people listening are going to be quite familiar with Amy, and Amy has been the most instrumental organization in terms of developing standards, not just for the larger medical device industry, but for us. And so I sit on a couple of work groups. I noticed you had Steve from Healthmark on last week. Uh, He and I are are on TIR 30, which is a cleaning of reusable medical device standard, and so we participate in that. And frankly, the SUD reprocessors are experts in cleaning. I mean, after all, these devices were labeled by the original manufacturer as for single use. So they didn't provide FDA with a cleaning validation. And so the agency expects that of us. And we've had to take devices um, 
that may be quite complex and reverse engineer them and find unique ways to take them apart in order to clean them. And so our participation in aiming and setting standards has been important for us, but it's also been a good platform for us to introduce our business and our expertise to the larger device industry. But then also, in short, as I mentioned before, we will reach out to all kinds of groups, from state-based central sterile professional groups to the federal, uh, to hospital associations, um, to practice greenhouse or other organizations that see this as a way to achieve their mission or, or which is sustainability in that case as well. You know, you may not have the answer to this one or not, but I wonder, was the FDA approval, and is it essentially, is it a 510K or you're just getting reprocessing? Maybe walk us a little bit through that. I, I wonder if the process of taking these single-use devices and giving them the ability to be reprocessed, albeit off-site at an expert location, um, I'm wondering, did that process of getting that approval, is that more complex than it would be for the original manufacturer even? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think this was the issue that originally presented the industry when they formed AMDR in the late 90s, which is you're reprocessing single-use devices. And so hospitals and professionals wanted to know, well, how's that going to work? And you can't bring every single healthcare professional through your reprocessing facility, though we'd love to do so, to show them that this is a real, legit, high-tech commercial operation that meets manufacturer standards. We actually sought FDA's regulation, and it's pretty rare for industry, I think, to go to the regulator and say, regulate us. But I think, you know, kudos and, and congrats to the foresight the guys had who had formed the original reprocessing companies to know that FDA regulation would mean legitimization. I mean, hospitals wanted to see that FDA seal of approval because then they know that a reprocessed SUD is as safe and as effective as a new device. And obviously, they know they cost half as much and reduce waste. So FDA's regulation has been legitimizing. But uh, to your question, indeed, uh, the regulations that apply to us in many ways are more stringent than apply to reusable device manufacturers. As I mentioned earlier, so if a device is labeled as reusable, FDA expects the manufacturer to do a cleaning validation, to write the instructions, and then to show the agency that the hospital is going to be able to follow those instructions, and it's going to result in a clean device. But if they label the device as single use, well, then none of that is required. So there's been a tremendous incentive for manufacturers just to slap the single use label on devices and then not worry about it. And by the way, they sell more devices that way too. And so what FDA then expects of us is to fill in the blanks where the original manufacturer did not do those cleaning and sterilization and functional testing validations, and we have to do that. And additionally, we have to mark our devices. Original manufacturers are not required to put some sort of indicia on the product, um, and we do. And so you'll you're, you'll see on the handles of larger laparoscopic devices, you know, the clearly uh, emblazed logo of the reprocessor. But for smaller devices, there'll be some marking somewhere. It may not be immediately visible, but we have to obviously track and trace all of our products to know how many times they've been reprocessed because FDA looks at that data. That's a fantastic point. I mean, especially with a new concept or new talk technology that, as you put it, fills in the blanks. They're obviously going to be watching it closely. But I would think that that data would only support everything that you said as far as the due diligence that had to be done to even bring this to market. What I think also that was really important that you said, and I don't want to just gloss over it either, but doing those tours – what everybody wants from their vendor community is transparency. So the fact that those doors were open, customers were encouraged to come and see the operation and see how valid it was. It probably looks exactly like manufacturing when you go in the door. If you were to tour any other instrument manufacturer, I would assume. I've not taken a tour, but maybe talk a little bit more about how important that is to, to be, you know, the transparency and showing people your processes. Cause I know not everybody does that. And I'm sure that in some cases there's uh, trademarking that's a concern and there's reasons not to, but it was obviously crucial to this business model. Absolutely. And, and frankly, in the early days, one of the catchphrases we had was seeing is believing. Um, a lot of people just did not think that this could be done and we would bring them through our facilities and they were completely changed. In fact, we had many physicians say to us, can we send you all our reusable devices? <laughs> and that's not the business we're in, but and we can't, you know, we can't, um, we'd love to do tours for everyone, but it's also just not realistic. And so I think my members have put up on their websites 
uh, some some basic overviews, including some videos, where you can see some of the non-proprietary uh, steps that are going in, uh, because it does operate a lot like a medical device manufacturing facility, except that we're taking apart devices that in some cases weren't intended to be taken apart. And so they'll develop unique proprietary equipment that can open a trocar or, you know, the handle end of a laparoscopic device so that we can get in there and clean it and put it back together again. But to your point on transparency, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the industry has always realized the legitimization and the value that comes with transparency. In the early days, it was the FDA regulation and, as you said, the plant tours to show people that this is a safe uh, and, and respectable operation that uh, yields safe and effective devices. You know, now I think the transparency issue that I'm seeing a lot of hospitals demand is um, on the pricing and to make sure that, you know, they can truly maximize their reprocessing. And uh, the industry has changed. We once had third-party reprocessors that had no affiliation with the original manufacturer. And as the industry has grown, now we have subsidiaries of original manufacturers that are reprocessors. And so regardless of who a hospital chooses to do business with, they want to know, are these devices being reprocessed? If we're getting a combo deal of new and reprocessed, how many times? Are you providing me a transparent report of how much I'm saving? Um, what are you doing with the products when they can't be reprocessed anymore? Can you do anything to re recycle them? And I think these are all things that, that are the current challenges in terms of providing value and transparency that we'd like to focus on, you know, in, in the future. So, Dan, what does the education side of AMDR look like then, um, you know, going back, the whole whole reason we started this podcast is there's so many topics out there that are just unknown to facility leaders, to frontline technician, to folks in the industry, but maybe in a different sector of the industry, and they're just unaware. Uh, I imagine a lot of your role is to increase that awareness, but what does it look like on the front lines? Are you going to uh, these big ISHA meetings? Or are you meeting with the surgical residents before they come out and to communicating the difference between a reprocessed device and um, the first-time single-use device? I'm just interested to hear what happens there. Yeah, that's my job, and... Um so in addition to reaching out, you know, at Amy and Isham and AORN and those types of, of groups, um, there's been a lot of international attention on this issue. And other places like Japan and Europe have adopted the same sort of approach to SUD reprocessing, which is to regulate it as a manufacturing activity, which, you know, sort of takes it out of the hospitals because you can't expect a hospital to reuse a device without cleaning instructions. But these third parties or these commercial firms can. So it's a lot of ministries of health. Just like in the early days, there was a lot of communication with FDA. Um, and I guess the, the, the core message, regardless of whether or not it's ISHM or it's um, the American Hospital Association or a regulator is, you know, how does this work? Like, walk me through the steps. Like, how do you, how do you get the device to your facility? What types of processes do you go through? How do you know it's safe? Like, just run me through the basic uh, information and how are you regulated? So that's a big chunk of it. Um, I think in the U.S., we're sort of at the next level. A lot of people understand that SUD reprocessing is regulated. They know that they're not supposed to do it in the hospital or they're going to risk getting in trouble. Um, so they send it to commercial firms. And so I think some of the new things that we'd like to focus on are ways to maximize it. There's still a lot of low-hanging fruit, meaning a lot of, a lot of missed opportunities. And so what I think we're looking at is maximizing the value. You know, making sure that if it's the central sterile or materials manager professional, that they're having conversations with other people, with the nurses, with the doctors, so that they understand these are the hospital's devices. These are assets, and we should maximize the value of these assets. And so if that means sending them to a commercial reprocessor, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to put them in these bins, and we're going to use them off the shelf first because we'd rather keep that that money here at this hospital so we can – you know, pay our staff or hire new staff or buy new devices um, or buy fancy new equipment that the doctors want, but better those dollars that be kept at the hospital than sent out the door to a manufacturer or literally thrown into the trash. And so those are sort of the challenges and the educational things that I think we're going to be focusing on uh, in the future in the U.S. We'll be right back with Dan Vukalich 
president at AMDR. Dan, let's dive a little bit deeper into single-use devices, and let's start specifically with, let's define it. What is a single-use device, and also maybe some examples, because I know this is an audio broadcast, so we're not going to be able to show pictures of all the different types of devices that can be um, reprocessed, or maybe there are single-use devices that can't be reprocessed. Give us just that description, define it, and give people a, a visual, if you will, for our listeners. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, that first question you ask is the first question most people ask, which is, so you're reusing single-use devices, so how does that work? <laughs> and I think I think the answer to that is, is frankly, you know, why are these devices labeled as single-use? And the short answer on that is, you know, FDA doesn't decide if a device is labeled as reusable or single-use. It's up to the manufacturer. And so if a device can be sold and it doesn't require all that additional cleaning validation by just slapping a single use label on it, there's a big incentive for manufacturers to label more and more devices for single use um, rather than having to do all that reusable cleaning validation. So just because it says single use doesn't actually mean it can only be used for a single use. It just means the manufacturer chose not to do the cleaning validation. And as we talked about before, but this third party or commercial reprocessor has come along and gotten an FDA clearance if required uh, to do just that. And so uh, for the for those listening, and I know not everybody's going to know the ins and outs of what types of devices we're talking about, and so I'll, I'll go over sort of the main categories of devices that my members reprocess. Um, the first and probably the largest in terms of the biggest savings opportunity for hospitals is the cardiac cath lab. And so we do a lot of diagnostic EP or ultrasound cardiac catheters um, and for those that don't know, the price points on these are from $500 to $2,500 each. And I understand it's typical to use two or three per procedure. So the dollar savings potential is immense for these devices, uh, which hospitals go through a lot of. Um, the largest by volume would be what we call non-invasive or nursing area products. Um, these are a lot of ones that people sort of see as no-brainers, uh, tourniquet cuffs pulse oximeter sensors, bed alarms, devices that um, don't need to be completely disassembled are used in a, a non-invasive setting. Um, and so we reprocess those. Um, probably number one and number two by volume are pulse oximeter sensors and compression sleep by the number one or two of it, most of my members. The third in an area that I think is growing, both in the types of devices, the subset types of devices, and the cost um, savings potential is in laparoscopic surgery. You know, so the price points on some of these devices, like ultrasonic scalpels, uh, $500. And if the surgeon uses two to three of those per procedure, you know, that's quite a hit in terms of just the device costs for the procedure. It's great for the patient, right? We'll do this minimally invasive surgery rather than opening you up. But if we can help to keep the dollars at the hospital by extending the lifespan of those trocars or laparoscopic, you know, forceps or graspers by two or three cycles, that's a lot of savings potential. And then I think the last area would be orthopedic. A lot of arthroscopic shavers, blades, bits, burrs, devices that are largely made out of, you know, surgical grade stainless steel. And so they, um, they're quite durable. And so we'll individually go through and resharpen those products so that the orthopedic surgeon uh, will recognize that device is every bit as sharp as if it was a brand new device. And I think those are the main categories of products that we're doing. So, Dan, we talked a little bit in Section 1 about what it looks like on the reprocessing side of this in terms of the workflow. Would you talk briefly about what this looks like in a hospital, how your members train and educate the nursing staff, for instance, on, uh, on the process for reprocessing actually on the front lines? Absolutely, yeah. So devices will be collected in different areas. And so we don't mix those compression sleeves or pulse ox sensors. Those are collected in one area in a separate sort of container versus those, the OR, which are going to be those laparoscopic devices. And so um, they're collected, and you need to obviously communicate with everybody in the hospital who's going to be in those areas 
to make sure that they know what goes in the bin, where the bin is, and the importance of putting the product in the bin. And from there, they're shipped off to the commercial reprocessor where, you know, it's like a manufacturing operation. And, and it's a lot like a central sterile department, but on steroids because it's huge. And we're, we're doing truckloads of tourniquet cups. Um, they all go through the cleaning, the testing, the sterilization procedures, and then they're sent back to hospitals. Obviously, things that can't be reprocessed are rejected. Um, and devices that we scan in right at the first step that indicate they've already been reprocessed, the maximum cycles are immediately rejected as well. And we also have to get rid of and reject devices that have been poorly treated. And so another element in the training is, you know, treat these as assets. Don't treat it as garbage. Put those troll cars in the bin with some care. Um, don't, don't allow the physician who's not paying attention to just throw it on the floor. <laughs> these are assets. And, um, you know, the savings potential coming back to the hospital is not something that should be taken lightly. And so that's sort of a, a mixture of, you know, what's happening at the facility and what's happening at our facility. But I guess, you know, to your larger question, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but if you're a materials manager or a central sterile professional, you know, it's sort of the, the unsung heroes of the hospitals, right? These are people who are overworked, underpaid, and frankly, underappreciated. But if they screw up, <laughs> it's, the consequences are quite large. And so I like to see SUD reprocessing as one of those sort of areas where you can really stand out. So, you know, it, they're in charge of certain things that are coming through a materials manager or, or sterile supply, but a champion for a reprocessing program can, uh, by educating their peers and by working in conjunction with their reprocessor, um, can really drive a tremendous amount of savings and value for the facility and drive a lot of attention to themselves and say, well, look, this month we saved $26,000 uh, doing compression sleeves and the OR, and next month we're going to do $28,000. And all of that money is going to come back into the facility, and I bet the C-suite's going to notice um, because that's being a good steward financially and I think environmentally, and I think we all want to do the right thing. And, and frankly, to get recognition would be great as well. Oh, Dan, that's a, a fantastic point. And uh, talking to leaders who work for me in the sterile processing department, we're always looking for those opportunities to communicate on our resumes how we took ourselves from just a cost center to some place where you can see cost savings. And you're right. These are big numbers that tell a big story. And it, it's truly not that difficult to become that kind of tough advocate that you're talking about to drive the processes, to give those reminders. Even the, the TLC, like you talk about, of not cramming these things in the bins, that even though they are reprocessable, uh, they're not if you snap them in half. You know what I mean? Right. Um, right. And I think to I your had, point, um, let's just be transparent about it. You know, you, buying devices – it's easy. The sales reps are always around, and you just buy them, and then you throw them away, whereas reprocessing requires more work. It does require diligence. It does require constant education of people who are new and coming into the facility, and it requires constant sort of hand-holding to make sure that the products are put into the bin and make sure that the products are the first ones used off the shelf. So it does require work. It's not as easy as just buying new devices, but boy, the payoff is big. And I think that for these professionals, in order to sort of stand out, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. So just curiosity-wise, um, when you talk about the laparoscopic or the orthopedic devices, is this a, a situation where you would have multiple devices come in and say the right side of a device is broken or bent? Would you be able to mix and match? Or are we only talking about unit by unit, either it passes quality assurance or it doesn't? Um, I can answer part of that, and I can't answer all of it. I certainly know that we're allowed to replace components. So if the distal tip of a laparoscopic instrument has Teflon pads on it because it sort of cauterizes. For, for, by the way, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm not. <laughs> so, so forgive my. <laughs> You're actually impressing me, back. and I was wondering that same <laughs> thing myself because I was going, you know, he actually seems to know quite a lot about the instruments. This is great. So then well, I started I know, to think maybe you were like a nurse at one point. Like, Who's this Yahoo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But so we will replace those Teflon pads and we will sharpen a blade. And so I don't know the answer as to whether or not parts are being mixed and matched. What I do know also is that, um, you know, individual components of a product have to be phased out if they have been through a maximum number of cycles. So um, I don't know exactly if the devices are mixed and matched, but if they are, you can't, you can't max, you can't put a component with a two time troll car that's been used four times because if the maximum is three times, you know, that's that type of thing. That makes a lot of sense. And obviously I would think that as the industry has matured, gotten better and better data, right? It's all about gathering the data that helps you figure out where the sweet spot is for that. I'm sure that's been a big part as time has gone on. And so I'm, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I do want to talk about the FDA before we wrap this segment and just say there's been a lot of focus, especially recently, on regulating, I would say, you know, the repair industry and reprocessing, I think would fall into that same realm. But you know, the manufacturers have, have often said, well, you know, that you don't have an instructions for use for the repair. And the FDA has said, well, we don't really, you know, regulate that industry exactly. But there's definitely been some closer, you know, look at that. What do you think about the FDA, the FDA and their role in, in reprocessing in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. And a little bit of it is beyond my scope, which is having been around so long. I'll say, you know, in the late 90s, when the agency was contemplating regulating SUD reprocessing because of all of the lobbying from original manufacturers against it, um, I think what we what we understood what was going on in the conversations within FDA is, okay, we're going to regulate all secondary market activities, remanufacturing, refurbishing, reprocessing, any anybody that's out there doing that. And ultimately the decision was, well, that's not possible. We don't have the resources. And so they focused on SUD reprocessing first because these were devices labeled a single use and they wanted to see the cleaning validation since they were being reused. So I think there's a lot to be learned from that. And the two examples that stand out for me, the first that you brought up, which is remanufacturing or the service companies. And I don't represent them, so I don't know much about it. But I do think there are going to be lessons to be learned. They offer a value proposition like reprocessing, which is an external service, not necessarily affiliated with the manufacturer, that essentially extends the lifespan of the product. And I don't know the answer as to the appropriate level of regulation that needs to be applied to them. It may not be the same as full FDA treatment like SUV reprocessors. But another example that I think is related that's getting increased attention are the cleaning validation data expectations FDA has for the reusable device manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We all know there has been so much attention on inadequately clean devices and super bug outbreaks that frankly shines a spotlight on both the manufacturers and inadequate cleaning validations or poorly, you know, written instructions and also the hospitals and, so we got a problem, and I think there are some lessons to be learned in what FDA did with us. We clearly can't send all of reusable devices to an external reprocessor. It's just not practical. Um, but I do think the agency, given its authority to regulate manufacturing, um, can do more to demand reusable device manufacturers do a better job with those cleaning validations. And now we've seen they have done the same thing for reusable device manufacturers that they did with SUV reprocessors, which to pro- which is to provide guidance on their expectations, on the types of things that they should be submitting and they should have done in a cleaning validation. And I understand the FDA has even released a list of devices that they're going to be playing, paying special attention to. So that's great because, you know, you know, Joe Blow on the street doesn't really understand single-use reprocessing happening in an FDA-regulated firm versus what's happening in a center still. They just see this word reprocess and medical device, and they need to know it's safe. And they don't really understand where it's happening and the level of regulation. And so I think what we're all doing as professionals to sort of raise the standard is great. And so I love sitting at these Amy and FDA meetings and participating and, and seeing how the conversation goes. But I also sort of take a little bit of delight um, seeing that the cleaning validation standards that FDA put in place 15 years ago for us are now essentially being applied to the, to the big boys. I think that was an excellent answer, Dan, and definitely illuminating to 
sort of the process and it really looks like you may have paved the way for a lot of these discussions and I couldn't agree more and I'm sure Hank is the same way about cleaning validation procedures and and really just making sure that you know that's being handled properly and then you know the other part of that is is really communication so it's not always about how the device is cleaned but how it's communicated to clean it and ultimately I know you didn't address this but standardization not only in the structure of how that's written, but in the types and ways, you know, some consistency across the board would also be, I think, a welcomed improvement. So you just decrease the amount of variation and increase the effectiveness. And I would imagine in single use device reprocessing, that's, that's the case is that there's a, a lot of standardization in the way that you approach that. So, uh, certainly appreciate your insight. And we're going to be back with Dan right after a short break. Dan, this has been an engaging and insightful interview to date, and I know we're getting here into the the final segment, but one of the things we talked about is just the cost savings, which obviously can be passed forward to the institution and, and, and ultimately to the patient too, but Maybe there's some other ways that hospitals and patients benefit from single-use uh, device reprocessing, and, and maybe you can illuminate us to that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, earlier in the conversation, I mentioned that just using a reprocess device is, on average, about half the cost of buying a new one. So immediately, you know, there's that obvious savings of if I use this reprocess version, it's half as much again. But if I use it two or three times, then you're compounding the savings. But I think for... For discussion purposes, you know, I'll take it to the next level. Hospitals that reprocess their single-use devices force the original manufacturers from whom they're buying to drive down the prices for new equipment. And so it doesn't happen for every device type, but AMDR's members have long seen this, and we uh, actually have a government accountability office report that acknowledged this happens. Manufacturers will lower their prices for hospitals to compete with reprocessors. But that didn't happen, and it doesn't tend to happen if you're not reprocessing. And so there's a competitive pressure as well. And I'll just tell you a a historical anecdote. You know, a long time ago, we were in the business of reprocessing um, biopsy forceps. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were doing our reverse engineering, and we sent, at at least one of my members had, the single-use biopsy forceps and the reusable biopsy forceps. I think the single-use was about... 60 bucks, and I think the reusable was like well over 100. We sent them to an independent lab, and the lab came back and said, these are the same device. They're just labeled differently. Well, it makes sense. The manufacturer doesn't want to change the way they manufacture the devices, but some hospitals were willing to clean it. Some hospitals just wanted to throw it away, so they'll sell it at two different price points. So what does the smart hospital do? They buy the single-use one for 12 bucks, or 20 bucks, rather, or 40 bucks, I don't remember, and then um, they will reprocess it. And so hospitals were doing that. And we were in the business of doing a lot of those disposable biopsy forceps. Eventually, the manufacturer lowered their prices. I think ultimately, they brought their prices down to 12 bucks, and we can't reprocess it for 12 bucks, so we're not doing biopsy forceps anymore. But the, the lesson here is, unless you reprocess, you don't, you, know, you don't force the original manufacturer to do anything to lower their prices. And then the last is just the environmental reduction. You know, it costs a lot of money for hospitals to dispose of medical waste. And so by taking a lot of those instruments, particularly out of the OR or the cardiac cath lab, and sending them to the reprocessor, not only are you putting those devices to their highest possible use, which is reuse, uh, when they're done, it becomes the reprocessor's responsibility to get rid of it. And so that reduces the cost to the hospital as well. So that's a really good point. That's that's a savings that really is is maybe not one that most people would realize and and a lot of times equipment that's obsolete not being used anymore doesn't even necessarily get uh disposed of right away it winds up taking what up a lot of space in a place in the hospital that a lot of people like to call the graveyard and uh <laughs> that's a really great point that by reprocessing these the reprocessor is responsible for disposing of them and and disposing of them of them properly. Another thing I wanted to follow up on too, I, I can I can liken what you just described in your scenario about the biopsy forceps and that price coming down to what I would call those single use contacts. You know, everybody says, "Oh, you can't wear those twice." Um, 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. I saved a lot of money on my contacts going with the single use mm-hmm. contacts and I haven't had any problems with infection. And I think that I suppose yeah. that's probably a very similar, uh, um, concept that's going on in, in the people's day to day lives as well. Yeah, no, in fact, uh, yeah, obviously we're not in the business of doing contact lenses, but on precisely this point, when I think the Government Accountability Office was looking at this subject of SUD reprocessing nearly 20 years ago, um, 60 Minutes, in fact, I think did a piece on how Johnson & Johnson sold daily wear contact lenses and disposable contact lenses, and they charged different price points depending on what the customer wanted, but an independent lab showed they're the same. So a smart customer will buy the cheaper disposable ones and reuse them. That said, that was 20 years ago. I'm not advising anybody to reuse contacts past what their doctor says. (laughs) (laughs) I was just going to say, I wasn't (laughs) nearly that informed, but I was that brave. (laughs) Uh, So, Dan, I wanted to jump in here on the benefit side of things and, you know, get to one of the questions that uh, I think we referenced in a previous segment, but on the education piece, uh, particularly for the operating room question and educating surgeons that this device is safe. It's as safe uh, if it's been reprocessed as it was the first time we used it or as a, uh, a standard reusable item is safe. And part of that comes to the ability to track the reprocessing life cycle of the particular instruments. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Absolutely. And I know device tracking and the UDI regulation have been things of interest to to all of us. Uh, So the single-use device reprocessing industry has been required to track all of, well, to trace all of their devices down to the individual level. Because if a troll car comes back, we need to know how many times it's been reprocessed, where it's coming from, so that we don't reprocess it past its maximum number of cycles. So while it may not necessarily be UDI compliant because we don't fully know what that will look like, we have used different tracking mechanisms to trace everything. Um, And so it has ranged from laser etching on metal or plastic devices to barcoding and using uh, some sort of uh, a fixed barcode to a product. Um, And so you'll, you'll see those on the reprocessed versions of devices. Sometimes it's real low tech for a compression sleeve, you know, may not be a, um, you know, a barcode, it may just be a dot system, but the dot system is unique to that processor and they have people on the front line who are the first to receive those who will know how to read it and know whether or not they need to be rejected or not. So we'll see. I think just like the cleaning validation example, this is an area where the commercial SUD reprocessors are actually a little ahead of the curve. As I said, it may not cross the T's and dot the I's exactly the way UDI requirements will emerge. You know, I think we've got to leg up and that we've been doing this for some time. And so you spoke on segment one, the reasons that you got into the industry, into this industry in particular, being your passion for sustainability. What role does that play in medical device reprocessing on the hospital side, but then just as the healthcare industry grows? Yeah, absolutely. I think when I got into it, my interest was environmental sustainability. And for the reasons we talked about, you know, it's obvious if we can repurpose these products, again, that meets the environmental component. Um, But I've also learned financial sustainability is also important. And so while some people reprocess because of the environmental benefits, I think most do it for the financial sustainability element. But I say sustainability because there's now a focus on value and hospitals aren't going to get reimbursed anymore um, if they don't get certain results. And there's new bundling payment systems that are going to reward hospitals not on you know, how many procedures and how many devices they use, but how good will they, they churn out. And so if we're offering a product that it operates as safely and effectively and in every way that the original product did, but at half the cost, and we keep all of that value in the healthcare institution, um, you know, we're going to win at this new value proposition in healthcare. And as we talked about earlier, everybody's looking for a way to do more with less. And I think we're processing a sort of low-hanging fruit. I absolutely agree. And, you know, going to that, I know we briefly spoke about the challenges uh, for particular instrumentation, again, going into the operating room or even into the endo side with these scopes. If we have reusable medical devices that 
for whatever reason, be it FDA, be it manufacturers' instructions for use, or just the facilities applications or or misapplications of those, if those devices are not getting properly cleaned and processed. And then there's this option over here for a single-use, three-processable device that is, man, the choice is simple. Yeah. Am I missing something? No, I mean, I, I think you're right. So when you have a clinician who may express some reservation about using this commercially reprocessed single-use device, I think sort of what you pointed out is the answer, which is these SUD reprocessors are meeting FDA requirements. They're both developing a cleaning validation like the manufacturer, but they're also executing it like a central sterile department, but on a massive commercial scale. They've got immense volumes, but for a narrower set of products. And so they're able to achieve a consistency that's just not feasible at the hospital level that has almost a zillion different products, uh, you know, and a myriad of different instructions and different ways to clean these things. And so there should be a lot of comfort that clinicians have when they're getting a reprocessed SUD because it's meeting all the same specifications as any other new device that they would be using. So what are the challenges that we haven't talked about yet on the inside of hospitals or maybe, you know, some of the challenges that your members are confronting not related to the FDA regulations that we've already covered? Yeah, I think, you know, it largely relates to value. I mean, obviously, there's always questions you're going to get about, well, how, how does that work? And explain to me what standards that meet so that I know that this is, you know, on the up and up. You know, that's going away. I think more and more people understand that now it's on the business side and hospitals are are shining a light and looking for every opportunity to maximize value. And so different proposals are coming out from different companies that purport to sort of save hospital money. And so what we what we're trying to shine a light on is, look, you know, to, to save money and reduce waste, you have to maximize the devices that you're reprocessing. And you have to manage your program, things that we talked about. And so what we've seen is some original manufacturers have come into hospitals and said, well, forget about this reprocessing. You know, if you just sign an exclusive with us for compression sleeves, we'll give you all new pumps. And some hospitals sign these agreements. And it looks great because free stuff is always wonderful. But sometimes you got to send these things to somebody else to review the financial implications because maybe that actually, those pumps aren't really free. You're just paying through it by buying a minimum quantity of, of sleeves you don't need. Um, and so it's those types of things that we're trying to shine a light on now at AMDRs. You, you really have to look at these deals to make sure it's in your facility's best interest. And I guess the advice I have is you got to manage the program. You can't sort of, uh, you can't sort of, uh, hand it over to the vendor and just trust that the vendor is going to give you the best, you know, the best deal. It's in their interest to sell you all new devices. So I, I, uh, I encourage hospitals to look at these deals, to evaluate contracts, to find out if they can't save more by actually sticking with a reprocessor versus doing something with exclusively with an original manufacturer. And so those are the things that we're looking at now and the challenges we're facing now. Yeah, those are a couple of great points. And, as we wrap, I want to throw out um, maybe something that's more for our listeners, but how does somebody get into this industry? I'm definitely thinking about frontline technicians that maybe are, are looking for a little spin on their job, and, and maybe there's positions within the uh, single-use device reprocessing plants where they could they could go and, and use their skills. So I just, you know, I know not all, but many of our listeners are looking for career growth or ways to take their sterile processing experience and apply it in, in other ways down the line and through a career growth plan. Um, how does somebody get into reprocessing? Do you ever see people that worked in sterile processing winding up with jobs inside of the plants? Well, certainly, uh, you know, in terms of number of employees, those sterile processing professor, professionals on the line, uh, we got more of those than anyone else. Um, but because we operate like a manufacturer, we also have a lot of people who come from the medical device manufacturing world and engineers and management. So we have people from all walks of life. You know, I don't know exactly, so I would just suggest that if anybody's interested, go to my website, which is amdr.org. And there's a members tab, and on that, then you're able to click through to any one of my member reprocessors, and I'm sure you can get more information that way. <laughs> you actually answered both of my final questions. The other one was, where can people learn more about AMDR? So 
<laughs> we we processors were always one step ahead, one step ahead on cleaning, one step ahead on tracing, and one step ahead of you on your questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful, Dan. <laughs> That's great. All right, well, everyone. We try hard. Yeah, no, you, well, you've done a great job in this interview, and I just wanted to say thank you for not only, um, you know, being willing to share your information and spend some time with us, but uh, also for having a good sense of humor and being an entertaining interview. I know that's, uh, that's always good for the audience to have uh, a good laugh while, uh, while we're all talking and learning more about the industry. Well, good. I appreciate it. And then obviously, if people are, are interested more in the information that we have here at AMDR, as I said, I, you know, you can reach us at amdr.org. Um, and I, I think most of it's there. There's a resources tab. So for a lot of the questions you ask where the doctor's giving you pushback, there may be some resources there that would be helpful, uh, you know, to, to listeners. And so I would urge them to check that out. Yeah, we're all about building the resources out to the field. And so uh, we may even put that link right in the show announcement as well, Dan. So thank you very much again. That was Dan Vukulich, president at the Association of Medical Device Reprocessors, a trade association representing the interests of the global commercial medical device reprocessing and remanufacturing industry. Hank, I think I, I just had fun. Straight up, I just had a lot of fun yeah. with Dan. I thought it was insightful. A lot of things in there that he said um, that that I think are key takeaways and really help frontline technicians understand reprocessing in a different light. But but most importantly, we had a lot of fun. No, that's absolutely right, Justin. And it shone a light on another part of the industry that – I think folks don't really understand what's going on with those single use reprocessing and um we talk so much about sterile processing uh industry being uh, unknown or, or not understood and then here we have a whole other sub industry uh it's a part of that and not just sterile processing obviously because they're processing um other devices not even used in the operating room but it was such a good opportunity to see that, hear what's going on, and hear the opportunity for hospitals and patients um, to reap the benefits of this entire industry. I really like the um, the fact that, or the point where reprocessors created a competitive landscape. I think that's really key. And even to the point where sometimes it wound up making the reprocessing in the instance he described to the biopsy forceps where, you know, reprocessing was no longer, you know, a cost savings option. It basically became an obsolete reprocessed uh, device. But that competitive landscape is good for rising health care costs. And that that was a great message, I think, to take home with. That's right. Yeah, I was sitting over here thinking like it makes our reusable instruments cheaper. I would have never even made that connection prior to this interview that those folks over there are actually help driving our prices down. Fantastic. The big thing that stuck out to me also was the technology already in their industry for tracking these devices to the instrument level. Uh, so interesting. It works for them on a massive global level, it's encouraging now for us on the sterile processing side to say we can do it. Yes, there's challenges. Yes, we still have not got it all figured out on how it's going to look. But, man, if, uh, if they could do it on plastic, we can definitely do it on stainless steel. You know, working in the repair industry, a lot of times people are like, oh, what's the life of an instrument? And we really don't have that kind of data tracking because we don't go to the instrument level. So that UDI implication for them, these reprocessing customers, I mean, uh, reprocessing companies do have that information. And I think that's incredibly valuable. You and I are big data heads, I think. And again, it's always played out in a lot of these interviews, but that's just another application of big data that can help I think customers make informed, solid decisions and maybe UDI law will grow into, um, you know, regular reprocessed in instruments as well. I know there's plenty of serialized instruments out there, but even look at your, uh, osteotomes. You know, every time they're sharpened, they get shorter. It would be awesome to know 
you know, based on, you know, <laughs> which surgeon used that osteotome so many times, right? Like, uh, it would, th- that kind of data could really be, uh, incredible. And, and maybe it's too deep and maybe nobody would ever do anything with that much data, but it certainly would be interesting to get your hands on it and dive around. I think the other thing that Dan, said that I thought was a serious take home. And I think this is what makes reprocessing relatable to technicians that are used to reprocessing devices with IFUs. But single use does not mean it can only be used once. It just means that the manufacturer didn't choose to take the steps to validate it for cleaning and sterilization, which is a decreased cost for the manufacturer. There's a lot that goes into, you know, getting the approval for a device to be able to be repro- uh, to be um, cleaned and, and sterilized. So that to me was uh, a, a really important point and one that I think just takes single use device and, and makes it understandable. Yeah. The only other thing that I'll add to that is he brought up the importance of of care and handling for these devices. Um, I have seen it firsthand. The perception is this is a bin. It's in the corner, just like a trash can, and I'm going to treat this stuff. Even though I know that it's going someplace to be reprocessed, I'm going to treat it like trash, like a piece of plastic. Um, and he brought up the same kinds of concepts that we treat even for a our instruments that we're sending out for repair, perhaps, just because it needs to go out for repair doesn't mean that you can handle it however you want because the repair may be more expensive if it gets broken further. So uh, that was just a great point that can uh, hopefully help some of our listeners, you know, drive those savings, like you said, to be the heroes of their departments and their facilities to really bring those savings to bear uh, on these opportunities. Yeah, it makes me think about rigid scopes, the most improperly named device in the industry. <laughs> There's nothing rigid about it. They're <laughs> delicate. You know, they're, they're not rugged scopes. They're yeah. delicate. Uh, but yeah, it's the similar kind of concept. You know, you have to take care of your, anything you pay money for, you have to take care of it and you can't, uh, I think treat it like trash to, to use that is, is not trash. So that's going to do it for this week's show. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed our interview with Dan. I know I certainly did. You can listen to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We would appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us. And on behalf of Hank and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.